Good morning and welcome back to our Monumentality Conference. Uh, we had a wonderful, very rich, very full day yesterday with wonderful presentations, with very interesting moderation. So thank you to the speakers and the moderators. And I do know that we are going to uh, head into another rich and very full interesting day of presentations and moderation and we'll end then in the evening after the reception in the private dining room and everybody here please um, come and join us and spread the word about it. Bef after our uh, conference is over we head over to the reception and then we come back to the Harold Williams Auditorium for Siasta Gates um, film presentation. So, welcome back and enjoy the day. Oh, and now I'm handing it over, the first session, sorry, to Nicholas Drosos, one of our postdoctoral fellows here, and he's going to introduce the first session. All right, good morning everyone and welcome. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our first session for the day, uh, Monumentality and the Technological Sublime, part one. So, very quickly, our first speaker is Alison Griffiths, who is a professor of film and media studies at Baruch College and in the doctoral program in theater at the CUNY Graduate Center. Her research crosses the fields of film studies, 19th century visual culture, and medieval visual studies, and examines cinema's relationship to and experience in non-traditional spaces of media consumption. Griffiths is the recipient of a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship, as well as fellowships from the Huntington Library, where she's currently based, I believe, the ACLS, the NEH, and many other institutions. She's the author of three monographs and multiple articles, uh, including the award-winning Wondrous Difference, Cinema, Anthropology, and Turn-of-the-Century Visual Culture from Columbia University Press, Shivers Down Your Spine, Cinema, Museums, and the Immersive View, again from Columbia University Press, 2008, and Carceral Fantasies, Cinema and Prisons in Early 20th Century America. Her forthcoming book, entitled Nomadic Cinema, A Cultural Geography of the Expedition Film, examines cinema as a tool of exploration in the interwar period. Her paper today, I believe, draws from this new research and is entitled Cinema in Extremis, Mount Everest and the Politic Poetics of Monumentality. Nice Freudian slip there. Uh, so without further ado, please welcome Alison Griffiths. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for that very gracious introduction, and thank you to the Getty Research Institute for inviting me to share my research with you today. I feel like we should turn down the uh, AC in here to make it nice and chilly for this presentation, um, but uh, here we go. Um, Mount Everest represents the ultimate earthbound challenge to the human body, as well as to cinema's technological mediation of the real, overdetermined as a geological environment and culturally imagined space. It is extremely difficult to climb and equally challenging to film. The perils of the former indubitably affecting the conditions of possibility of the latter. The unsuccessful Everest expeditions of 1921, 22, and 24, undertaken by members of the Royal Geographical Society and the Alpine Club in London, employed still photography and in the latter two expeditions, motion pictures to document their ascent. The three journeys can best be understood in dialectical terms, shaped by oppositions between the political, cultural, and socioeconomic landscape of the region versus British ambition and national identity and the place of the mountain in the cultural imaginaries of the Tibetan residents versus those of the English visitors and the explorer's masculinist narratives of heroism and wish fulfillment versus autochthonous beliefs in the mountain spirituality shared by the native people. Everest, or Chamalungma, the goddess mother of the world as it is known in Tibet, is a monumental feature, feature of nature. And similar to a built monument, it is experienced differently by different stakeholders. While the British climbers initially mocked its spiritual significance among Tibetans, endeavoring to take on the mountain in barely concealed metaphors of masculinist domination and sexual assault, their attitude towards the mountain seemed to shift across the expeditions notably in the wake of the loss of life among the climbing party. 
My goal in this talk is to read the cinematic output of these expeditions, the 1922 film Climbing Mount Everest and the 1924 The Epic of Everest through three topoi of monumentality, scale, aesthetics, and nationalism. On the question of scale, expeditions are mini monuments in motion, laboriously and obtrusively invading the local landscape while dependent on locally procured human and animal labor presenting a spectacle arousing both suspicion and amusement from local onlookers. As an exercise in logistics, intercultural communication, and transportation management, an expedition can be defined as purposeful travel, designed to advance knowledge. Its goals shapes, its goals shaped, as historian William Gertzman argues, by the previous experiences, the values, and the current objectives of the civilized center from which the, exp from which the explorer sets out. With regards to the aesthetic issues raised by the two films, I argue that Everest's monumental geography and the challenges of climbing and filming at extreme altitude paradoxically serves, serve to both constrain and open up possibilities for cinema, not dissimilar to its use in the Arctic and Antarctic, but with the added challenge of extremely high altitude. Lastly, the two Everest films are shaped by discourses of nationalism, evincing what Karina Apostol calls an illusion of immutability, managing the national shame of failure by activating myths of heroism and memorialization of George Mallory and Andrew Irvine, the two British climbers who lost their lives in the 1924 attempt. By way of conclusion, I explore how cinema's imaginative geography and unique spatio-temporalities transform the, view the viewing of the Epic of Everest into a commemorative ritual a reenactment and memorialization of the 1924 expedition that, like most memorials, show signs, shows evidence of the symbolic accretion associated with Derek Alderman and Owen Dwyer's idea of the discursive shape-shifting adumbrating monuments. Rereading these films in the historical spotlight of the outrage and diplomatic crises they mobilized when first exhibited in England, as well as their status for contemporary Tibetan peoples, can mobilize counter-narratives that disrupt dominant interpretations of the past. Whose memory the Everest films parse and preserve is a charged political question, one as relevant to the art of filmmaking as to monument making. And while monuments and films may appear to be stable artifacts, their associated memories are highly mutable, exposing contradictions and the possibility for counter-monumentality. Like many large-scale expeditions into inhospitable climates, conquering Everest, Everest was a monumental undertaking on several levels. Laying claim to a pioneering spirit as a national birthright, British explorers considered Mount Everest the third pole. And given their failed attempts to be the first to reach either the North or South Poles, claiming victory on Everest through what Harold Hobush calls vertical imperialism would serve to restore national pride and bolster Britain's status within the climbing community. But as Gerig Simmel argued, modernity itself exerted a certain pressure on the need to climb. Since, and I quote, the less settled, less certain, and less free from contradiction modern existence is, the more passionately we desire the heights that stand beyond the good and evil whose presence we are enabled to look over and beyond." End quote. Escaping the constraints of modernity in search of authentic adventure shaped much of climbing's discourse, pitting cinema as a uniquely modern recording device against the idea of a pristine climbing experience that represented more of an inner psychic triumph than an outward show of geographic domination although we can't ignore the powerful visium, visual um, idiom of flag planting in conquest history, a highly anticipated and imaged event. Climbing Mount Everest in the 1920s was in many ways a throwback to old school exploration, closer in style to the indelible image of the Arctic explorer foot slogging in front of his sled rather than the motor cars and airplanes that catapulted exploration into the 20th century. Even Everest Summit, official Everest photographer and cinematographer Captain John Knoll predicted, would one day be accessible by plane. Climbers dropped off at the top and only having to make the descent with the assistance of oxygen. Imagine that. In the European imagination, Everest represented a space of sublime vertiginous vastness, similar to what Siobhan Car Carroll calls a topic space. 
places presumed to lie at or beyond the fringes of everyday life, where human habitation is temporary and associated with mobile peoples such as explorers, exiles, refugees, bandits, and mutineers. The cinematic record of the attempts on Everest might be understood as examples of atopic cinema, set in environments that test the technological and ontological limits of film's capacity to record Everest's scale and monumentality, but nevertheless can produce images of breathtaking beauty and striking surrealism. The two Everest expedition parties resembled a small invading army. 80 mules hired in the Chumbi Valley, 200 yaks, and the advance party's luggage spread over miles of countryside. The expedition party could also be mistaken for a religious pilgrimage, a subterfuge used by Brigadier General Charles Bruce when he justified the British desire to climb Cholamunga to the Zatul Rinpoche, the head lama at the Rombok Monastery, recalling that he was inspired to say that the entire expedition was in fact a pilgrimage rather than a sporting event with high geopolitical stakes. Quick to recuperate the endeavor from the Association of Tibetan Buddhism, John Noe clarified, quote, we were only pilgrims of adventure. Our business was to fight the mountain, not to worship it, end quote. The iconography of expedition gear, including boxes, pack animals, sketch pads, typewriters, and oxygen tanks, serve as substitutes for the invisible technique of the filmic apparatus, which was only shown in a few still photographs. Shooting and developing film at Everest Base Camp was fraught with difficulties, including the static electricity that threatened to fog the film when rolling or unrolling it, and the sheer effort of handling a full-size kinematograph camera, in addition to color filters and lenses, including a 20-inch telephoto lens in rarefied altitude. While staying out of the way of the climbing party, Noel had to be opportunistic, tenacious, and strategic, overseeing a team of 10 porters dedicated to the enterprise of image making. Any 1920s expedition reaching Everest summit would have been unlikely to capture footage of the 29,028 foot peak. The best could be hoped for were still photographs and quite possibly not even these. For example, George Finch, whom Noel pegged as the most ardent Kodak snap shooter he'd ever met, took 2,000 photographs during the 1924 expedition, but none above the ice cliff at 27,000 feet as a result of the brain fog brought on by altitude sickness. Notwithstanding the logistical challenges Everest posed to filmmakers, the camera's sensory evocation of glacial landscapes containing diminutive humans heightened the spiritual and geographical significance and prestige of mountaineering, transforming the mountain into a stage upon which individual and national ambitions and conflicts would be performed. As an exercise in vertiginous optics, the conditions of filming Everest stressed cinema to the limits. Not surprisingly, Noel knew he would have to preface depictions of the summit attempt with travelogue footage of the expedition party's progress and with ethnographic scenes. Otherwise, he would have ended up with a 20-minute rather than a feature-length film. And I should point out that these are both feature-length 90-minute films. In the absence of individualized characters, Noel banked on two structuring motifs, the mystique of Everest in the contact zone of Tibet and the plight of the deracinated Englishman. Governed by the powerful quest motif of Mount Everest, the film suffers less than the typical expedition film's attenuated narrative propulsion. And yet the expedition's forward momentum is not continuous, since the constant back and forth labor by the Sherpa peoples between camps to deliver or replenish supplies represents repetitive movement excised from the cinematic record. Overdetermined as a subject matter, mountains privilege the telling of some kinds of stories over others. This does not mean, however, that climbing narratives are unassimilable to narratological systems of suspense, drama, false starts and hopes, and a range of human emotions, all of which are in evidence in climbing Mount Everest. An aesthetic and conceit of monumentality holds the film together in several respects. The narrative arc of conquest, the iconography of the extensive support system and labor, and cinema's own self-importance importance as a witness to history in the making all serve to shape the film's structure of feeling. Everest monumentality presented unique challenges to Noel. Its glacial structures play hide and seek 
as the climbers appear and disappear from sight, and at times the near abstraction of the image makes denotation difficult. No varied perspectives by placing the camera either behind, in front of, or perpendicular to the climbers, and often shoots from locations that climbers might avoid, away from the route, making the camera less of a virtual climbing partner than a lookout or sentry waiting for, the, for progress or for something interesting to film. Noel's camera also evokes a surveillance topos, especially when he parts company with the group and remains at Camp 3. Using a telescopic lens to shoot from a distance of three miles. These camera setups position cinema's mechanical eye on crags, ledges, and overlooks, sometimes looking directly at the climbing party <clears throat> and other times peering down or gazing upwards through a slow tilt. The upward gaze towards Everest summit evokes the experience of monumental sculpture that likewise evokes the sublime to trigger a sensory overload as we absorb the towering mass looming above us. An extreme long shot of climbers reduced to tiny specks in the landscape evokes mixed emotions, pitting the human against the natural environment with startling effect. The camera is now and we're just about to get to that shot, sorry. The camera is now a distant observer rather than a participant, a patient lookout that can only watch and wait. As Rebecca Grenard notes, the extreme long shots in vast ice fields simultaneously compromise visual cues about the differentiation of human figures while accentuating the magnitude of the explorer. Undistinguished from the Sherpas, the climbers become a single heroic mass though minimized within the monumental landscape. Unable to ascend further, Noel deployed camera movement, telephoto lenses, camera filters, and time-lapse photography, exposure of moving clouds, sorry, to compensate for the camera's distance from the climbers. Everest's monumentality mobilizes several interesting transpositions. Given the vast distances, while the telephoto lens expands the range of human vision, the footage lacks the rich detail one expects from magnification. Noel admitted that while the sequence may have been of interest to ice cliff geologists, quote, to the ordinary eye, it is not so spectacular because the figures are so small, lost in a maze of ice blocks and glistening snow surfaces, end quote. However, what the images lose in specificity, they gain through the sheer force of their existence, validating our status as spectator witnesses and the medium's role in co-authoring the narrative of hero heroic adventure in the land of the monumental sublime. Eight or tiny black dots move slowly down the frame over a series of three shots, like shifting crumbs on a pristine tablecloth. The slow cinema aesthetic of the long take was the perfect evocation of the distended temporality of mountain life. Mallory observing that, quote, the whole of life was scaled down as it were, that we were living both physically and mentally at half or less than half the normal rate, end quote. These saturated moments of looking where human involvement in the corporeal and mental trial that is mountaineering is conjured up in the juxtaposition of microscopic humans in the vast spaces of snow. Like looking at microbes under the microscope or scrutinizing an object, an obscure object in order to detect possible sentience, the camera seems to will the climbers to visibility and mobility, the latter the holy grail that Noel hoped would propel them to the summit. Nature and technology, therefore, in dialectical tension in climbing Mount Everest. Siegfried Krakow's idea of photography's desubstantiating rendition of natural phenomena, such as the hills of the, of the Rhine, reduced to tiny slopes that look ridiculous in photographs, or in desolate spaces such as Antarctica, where Jennifer Fay argues cinema becomes indistinguishable from photographs, or to, be, or to be more exact, from filmed photographs, gives us pause in the context of Everest filmmaking. Krakow's theory of cinema's revelatory and redemptive optic that allows us to experience the world as a fragmented rather than a holistic habitat, life at its least controllable, controllable 
what he called, quote, bits of chance events whose flow substitutes for meaningful community, end quote, seems especially relevant in the context of Everest, where Simon Sharma's idea of climbing as an experience, as an experiment, rather, in sensation, seems to find it e in its equal in Knowles' evocation of the mountain, an observational cinema aesthetic where diaristic visual fragments of camp life are juxtaposed with mountaintops, clouds, and ice. Unlike the eradication of meaning, Faye sees as overwhelming the traveler to the poles, save those in search of a national record. However, Everest is quite the opposite, replete with cultural specificity, given the amount of screen time Noel devotes to the expedition gaining the blessing of the head lama at the Rongbuk Monastery and into titles about Everest's purported mystical powers. The ontological slippage between film and photography in these moments of intense looking, the reversal of the trope of the blurred photograph imputing movement in a still medium, triggers both a contemplative gaze and a reckoning with each medium's capacity for emotional storytelling for representing what Svetlana Boim sees as, as an effective geography that often mirrors the melancholic landscape of the climber's own psyches. Cinema seems especially well equipped to capture moments of stasis and staring with the ever-threatened moment of the cut looming, looming over each shot. Noel's second attempt at filming Everest in the 1924, The Epic of Everest, afforded him a chance to consider the kind of mountaineer's eye he would need to transform the climbing attempt into a commercially successful film. Noel carefully considered the title for the film. He realized no one would be interested in seeing a film with the exact same title as the 22 expedition, and admitted to RGS secretary um, Howard Hinks that while the chosen title was a good one, as far as the public was concerned, to geographers, it may be incorrect, but still few geographers go to see movies, he said. The film's title is in no doubt an homage or sort of aspirational nod to the classic poem, The Epic of Gilgamesh, the ancient Mesopotamian work of literature that also contains a long and perilous journey. In stark contrast to climbing Mount Everest, which does not reveal the mountain until the last quarter of the film, the second film delivers, delivers Everest in the opening shots. Juxtaposing, juxtaposing the flowery language of the intertitles with stylized images of the mountain. Noel had practiced with time-lapse photography in climbing Mount Everest, and along with the color filters, these effects announced early on that Everest will be framed through a romanticized pictorial lens, one reminiscent of Victorian de, uh, photography and early daguerreotypes, a technique confirmed in oval matted long shots of Everest that construct it as a tamed view memorialized for commercial reproducibility. Many of the ethnographic sequences in climbing Mount Everest are filmed near the Shekhar and Rombuk monasteries. In addition to shooting footage of Lama priests performing ceremonial dances, Noel's wandering eye also lands upon an eclectic array of subjects, including female spectators of dances, male beggars, and musicians sticking out their tongues, a Tibetan um, greeting gesture. Noel's inner titles offer an array of Eurocentric phobias about the ethnographic other, especially standards of bodily hygiene and proximity to human and animal. And yet, in keeping with the film's dialectics, Noel dials back the disgust in footage of men and women of status in the same village. In one striking shot of a woman with an ornate turquoise-studded Ariel laced into her hair, the act of posing for the camera triggers a fit of the giggles as the woman raises her hands to cover her eyes and turns her head sharply away from the camera. The woman's laughter in this gif-like meme is contagious, suggesting that Noel was inviting his audience to use humor to manage their response to cultural difference. In addition, the woman's refusal to take the filming seriously complicates reading the film through a one-way colonial power metaphor. An example of a counterintuitive mode of mon monumentality, the miniature as a metonym for something vastly larger, occurs as the expedition party travels west towards Everest valleys. 
Noel cannot resist the human interest in the fate of a newborn donkey. Although even this, seems innoc this seemingly innocuous scene can't shake off the cruelty that simmers beneath the surface of the expedition film. While occupying more, little more than a small visual note, footnote in the film, such footage, footage evokes the so-called animal turn in the humanities, the ship that Dan von der Sommers describes as thinking about and with the category of animal. The turn invites more critical engagement with the place of animals within the geo-history of expeditions and in monument building. As von der Sommers argues, and I quote, the standard narratives of civilization, societies, and nations are built upon the backs of animals, large and small, even invisible, end quote. The ragdoll-like donkey not only signals the reality of animal births occurring en route, but points to the broader commodification of working animals and their welfare. An, an economic context that is as relevant today with the ongoing use of pack animals as it was 100 years ago. Forming the transportation networks of re remote landscapes, animals interceded in human affairs in a multitude of ways exploited not only as means for providing food and carrying supplies, but also for their cuteness and vulnerability. Most memorably, the group shot of the 1924 climbing team posing for the camera in front of a tent, reproduced countless times in books about the 1924 expedition, including the before and after moment, offering evidence of the camaraderie of mountain climbing and the camera's ability to corral human subjects into posable groups becomes um, becoming agents in their own memorialization. Seeing the climbing party chatting and milling around reminds us that the mountain is a space of private intimacy, homosociality, and in the case of Everest, public view. The epic of Everest transmogrifies in its final minutes into a suspenseful search and rescue narrative for missing climbers George Mallory and Sandy Irvine, whose Sherpas keep constant watch with telescopes. Refusing to accept that the climbers had died as a result of the elements or an accident, Noel performs a 360 degree move and contra his previous mocking of Tibetan beliefs about Everest's supernatural powers, embraces the idea that benevolent or malevolent forces can inhabit the natural world. As a fitting metaphor, visual metaphor for Chamalungma, Noel includes time-lapse footage of clouds creeping up the mountain from the bottom of the frame followed by a medium long shot of men building a memorial stone cairn. The close-up of the memorial inscription and obituary style headshots of Mallory and Irvine shown near the end of the film are in tension with a pantheistic, pantheistic discourse about nature and death, suggesting that as an anthroposophical process of self-interrogation, mountaineering has long negotiated a Taoist tradition of celestial transcendence as well as darker forces of destruction. Having ratcheted up the revenge narrative, an intertitle quotes the Rombok Lama's prophecy that the god of the Lama shall deny you white men the object of your search. Noel follows with a reprise of shots of fast moving clouds, this time filmed with a red filter in order to cement the idea of the mountain's demonic powers. Noel can't seem to decide on who to blame for the expedition's failure and loss of life. And while he banked on the fact that his poetic indulgences might go down well with audiences, several reviewers singled out the film's ending as hyperbolic and melodramatic. All right, so this third part is my conclusion. Um, as a testament to national aspirations in geopolitics, Noel's Everest films speak to the professional and popular perceptions of geography and exploration in the first third of the 20th century. 
In some respects, the public life of the 20s Everest films offer an example of the limitations of geography. Described by Joseph Conrad, writing the same year as the final expedition, as a blameless science, the one that enticed mortals, quote, away from their homes, to death maybe, now and then to a little disputed glory, not seldom to contumely, and never to high fortune, end quote. If the science of geography might be blameless, its foundational organizations and cartographic practices were nevertheless handmaidens to colonial and imperial policies and practices. Despite celebrating the British climbers' dogged determination to conquer Mount Everest in three highly publicized expeditions, neither film was a commercial success. Along the lines of um, Amundsen's South Pole lecture tours and Shackleton's films, and Knowles suffered huge personal losses as a result of the Epic of Everest's failure to, ex to secure extensive um, theatrical bookings. Anticipating that the third Everest film would be triumphal, Noel advanced payment of film and photographic stock, establishing the company Explorer Films to raise the 8,000 pounds needed to bankroll the, the, the enterprise. The company declared bankruptcy in 1926. This was seen as a win-win situation for the RGS. In exchange for giving up the film's distrib distribution rights, it would avoid costs related to the image making and would obtain a complete set of the photographic prints and motion pictures. In what would become a costly public relations disaster, Noel arranged for a group of seven lamas to accompany the film and perform a religious dance before screenings at the Scala Theatre in London, an ideal Noel hatched even before the expedition departed the UK. After press reports reached Tibet, the Dalai Lama was furious, both about the exploitation of the dancers and the film's purported flea-eating scene that is no longer extant. The complaint escalated into a mini international crisis and provoked Tibet's refusal to grant permits for subsequent Everest expeditions until 1932, when the British launched an unsuccessful fourth attempt, this time without a motion picture camera, as Tibet also banned film crews from Everest until the late 1930s. Also present inside the Scala's auditorium during the film's London premiere was an episode of dense London fog. While a fitting metaphor for the spirit of Chomolungma, the fog seriously interfered with the audience's enjoyment of the film, making it impossible, as one reviewer wrote, for, quote, some of the marvelous photography at high altitude to be fully appreciated, end quote, as the fog absorbed an estimated 75% of the projector's light. Everest's white infinity met its match in London's pea soup viewing conditions, ironically imbuing the film with an ahead of its time 4D effect, literalizing the dense clouds the climbers encountered at precipitous elevations. The meteor meteorological event augured badly for the commercial prospects for the film, a metaphor for the audience's inability to appreciate its virtuosity as the highest altitude motion picture ever shot, as well as the chronicle of the world record in climbing. As powerful symbols of nation building, expedition films like all effective propaganda can strike deep emotional chords with viewers drawing upon conventions of the picturesque, romanticism, the gothic, the sublime, the horror genre, the monumental, boys club culture, amateur filmmaking, the industrial film, the travelogue, newsreel, experimental, phantasmagoric, and ethnographic film. The Conquest Mode expedition film bears a burden of self-memorialization that other expedition films lack, however. If the goal is met, the film becomes a monument to a monumental endeavor satisfying what the authors of the 1943 essay, Nine Points on Monumentality, considered the monument's role in expressing the feelings and thinking of the collective force of the people. We might therefore think about how ideas of monumentality are re-signified in the context of natural features, such as mountains and in the medium of cinema, the kinds of symbolic work such features perform, and how films of exceptional human effort form a link between the past and the present in similar ways to human-constructed monuments. Julian Thomas's argument about tombs presencing the memories of ancestors in the landscape points up the phenomenological and discursive correspondences across films of human loss and the monument, powerfully evoked in the monument building at the end of Epic. The cairn serves as both a memorial and figural mass grave. It commemorated a total of 10 dead climbers, Mallory and Irvine and nine Sherpas, seven of whom died in an avalanche in the 22 attempt not dissimilar to war memorials that group casualties into a collective body count spanning several years, countries, and nationalities. There's a, a mise-en-a-beam quality to the monument within the film as monument, 
evoking um, Gianni Vattimo's argument that it is only ever memory rather than actual people's events or values that are inscribed by memorials. This feels counterintuitive in the case of cinema, whose indexicality, what we might think of its fleshy invocation of the human and animal, might seem far more tangible than the ancient structure or bronze sculpture. And just as monuments can be deconsecrated, broken down both literally and metaphorically through counter-monumental practices of performance art, so can expedition films be re-signified as part of a larger effort to decolonialize the archive. As Apostol argues, when a monument begins to come to life, to shrink, change, form, or speak back, it becomes threatening, possessed of agency, and even out, even out of the maker's control. In this regard, media anthropologist Faye Ginsburg's recent invitation to consider documentaries alternative regimes of value might as easily be applied to historical as contemporary works, especially when the communities represented on screen become collaborative partners. As we contemplate the meaning of the extant footage of the two Everest films, which were not necessarily the versions that were shown theatrically at the time, we are inevitably faced with the so what and now what questions with regards to disentangling contemporary valencies of these expedition films, such as their status as failed monuments, which obviously come into being in different ways with different audiences in different contexts. There's a recursive quality to each film, its narratives of human drama and tragedy repeatedly invoked in subsequent filmic accounts of attempted conquests. As the Ur tragic climbing film, the Epic of Everest has been remade both for global audiences, including the 1998 IMAX film Everest, as well as in the countless documentaries posted on YouTube and on social media. Everest's place in the cultural imaginary and its unique challenges to climbers are unchanged almost a century later. Although the environmental cost of commercialized climbing, as noted in the 2018 Netflix documentary Mountains, that recounts the traffic jam of May climbers on Everest, underscores the deleterious cumulative environmental costs of almost a century of monument of mountaineering on Mount Everest. The dead bodies littering the route to the summit, some with names such as Green Boots, have become macabre monuments to the sacrificial toll of attempting Everest. So both these films fun function as national memory for Sherpa peoples, memorializing their sacrifice, their labor, <coughs> and ongoing role in the climbing industry. The films also gave contemporaneous non-climbing Tibetans an opportunity to take a closer look at the British mountaineering party, themselves engaged in intense looking and sketching in addition to photography. For example, when the Tibetans saw the films before they were exhibited in the UK, they were fascinated by the camp culture and images of Westerners. During the expedition itself, Gurkha officer John Morris, who traveled with the 22 expedition, recalled that at every campsite, we were under close observation all through the day, not from any sinister motive, but out of sheer curiosity, end quote. Visually, the films negotiate the emic insider and etic outsider perspectives of the cross-cultural encounters with a remarkable complexity. The repeated stares of the Sherpas at the camera, inviting us to recuperate their agency and through fieldwork interviews with their descendants. The British Film Institute's 23 release of the restored Epic of Everest did not, as far as I'm aware, solicit contemporary reactions from the, from the Tibetans. Instead, the restored film's premiere at the um, London Film Festival was framed by discourses of national patrimony monumentality, a treasure from the BFI National Archive and visual memorial to Mallory and Irvine. The Guardian also inaccurately claimed that the film had been a huge hit when it toured the UK and the US, um, which is incorrect. There was no reference to Tibet in the public commentary on the film's re-release, despite the fact that almost two-thirds of its footage was recorded in local villages. Okay, last paragraph. Um, the two Everest films can become examples of how, as early 20th century philosopher George Santayana argued, the truths, facts, and circumstances of events can help us fill in the picture of historical experience. Squeezing Everest's vast scale into the camera's rectangular frame evoking both the mountain's sublime scale and the intimate labor of people struggling across the landscape, the two films offer compelling testimony of the human encounter with the natural world. Of course, the imagination fills in no small part of the rest of the picture, and through a triangulation of information from photographs, published accounts, and memoirs, we can add more detail. Ultimately, though, the picture remains incomplete. Henri Lefebvre's idea of monumental space as a poetic world through which the spectator moves is a useful heuristic for understanding expedition films 
as a synthesis of several modes of experiencing space. From the construction of somatic space, our sense of co-presence with the climbers through cinema's virtu virtual gaze, to perceptual space, what Christopher Tilly sees as a space of personality, of encounter, of emotional attachment. The 1920s Everest films therefore invite us to think more broadly about cinema's ability to construct and imagine monumentality. Tilly's idea that what space is depends on who is experiencing it and how is doubly signified in the case of cinema, where the meanings of Everest are encrusted layer upon layer by historical actors and audiences encountering the films over the past century. Thank you. Thank you, Alison, for this great paper. Uh, our next speaker, Sarah Newman, received her BA in Archaeological Studies from Yale University and her MA and PhD in Anthropology from Brown University. She's an anthropological archaeologist specializing in Mesoamerica with a particular focus on the ancient Maya. Her research examines multiple forms of human environmental interaction, including anthropogenic landscape change, the cultural and historical constructions of the concept of waste, and ancient human-animal relationships. She's currently Assistant Professor of Anthropology at the University of Vermont and will be moving to the University of Chicago in July. We're moving to a significantly hotter climate in her paper, Invisible Monumentality, Emerging Maya Landscapes. Please welcome Sarah. Thank you, Nicholas. Um, and thank you also to the, uh, for the other presentations and the discussions that we've had yesterday and that we'll have today. Um, they've given me a lot to think about already. Um, in 1841, the American lawyer, writer, and diplomat, John Lloyd Stevens, published Incidents of Travel in Central America, Chiapas, and Yucatan. The account chronicles a roughly year-long expedition accompanied by British architect Frederick Catherwood to, quote, travel to ruined cities, places, scenes, and monuments. Stevens' swashbuckling narrative emphasizes isolation, calling attention to unknown cities hidden in the midst of seemingly impenetrable and inhospitable jungles. For example, on reaching the ancient Maya city of Copan, Honduras, he writes, quote, it lay before us like a shattered bark in the midst of the ocean, her masts gone, her name effaced, her crew perished, and none to tell whence she came, to whom she belonged, how long on her voyage, or what caused her destruction. In Egypt, the colossal skeletons of gigantic temples stand in the unwatered sands in all the nakedness of desolation. Here, an immense forest shrouded the ruins, hiding them from sight, heightening the impression and moral effect, and giving an intensity and almost wildness to the interest. The ground was entirely new. The whole was a virgin soil. We could not see 10 yards before us and never knew what we should stumble upon next. The analogies to empty expanses of water and sand are a recognizable colonialist trope. The explorer discovers, or as Stevens himself put it, quote, snatches from oblivion, the ruins of a lost civilization that had hitherto been invisible. But Stevens had been passing through the remains of densely populated ancient Maya settlements for weeks before reaching Copan. And in fact, that immense, desolate, and mysterious forest was as much a product of Stevens' perished race, the ancient Maya, as the palaces and temples that so fascinated him. From Cicero to Regal, understandings of monuments have focused on enduring structures and powerful objects, that is, on things that are discrete, colossal, and long-lasting. Archaeology, similarly, was founded on the notion that artifacts, art, architecture, and objects, can be attributed, attributed to a particular person or people in a particular place at a particular time. Today, however, I offer three sets of case studies that complicate those ideas. These case studies detail large-scale, partly anthropogenic assemblages, artificial islands and swamps, manipulated forests and savannas, modified hill slopes and watersheds, that despite their massive temporal and spatial scales, often remain invisible to archeologists. The first set, figure and ground, examines ancient Maya monumentality beyond, between, and below monuments, the interstices and substrates that are often overshadowed by the built environment. The second, vaster than empires and more slow, 
borrows this line from an Andrew Marvel poem to call attention to what we might think of as slow monumentality, the long-lasting modifications made to forests across the Americas. Finally, Fractals and Flows takes us further afield to the former desert paradise of Petra in Jordan to ponder how we might approach anthropogenic systems so monumental that they appear both endless and timeless. Each set of case studies challenges the practice, if not the nature, of archaeology, asking how we might recalibrate methods of inquiry and interpretation to allow for forms of monumentality that are both multiscalar and multitemporal. In an off-sided article on ancient monumentality, archaeologist Bruce Trigger saw the defining feature of monuments, especially architecture, as, quote, scale and elaboration that exceed the requirements of any practical functions. Size, as a proxy for power and prestige, emphasizes the energy and labor expended. The bigger the monument, the more powerful the ruler. Even in cases where archaeologists have flipped that narrative, positioning laborers or simply mundane labor as the agents of monumentality, the notion of a monument as a discrete entity remains. Prehistorian Richard Bradley even writes that the de defining characteristic of monuments is the fact that they, quote, impose an artificial order on the use of space. That is, when archaeologists speak of, write about, and study monumentality, the focus is on the built artificial environment. What happens if we shift our attention to the extensive archaeological landscapes that underlie those structures, to the ground on which plazas are built and pyramids stand? Recent developments in remote sensing technologies have made it possible to penetrate jungle canopies over vast territories, including the ancient Maya heartland of northern Guatemala. The expanse of ancient settlements unveiled by aerial laser, scanning is, aerial laser scans is staggering. As those scans now make clear, integrated urban settlements canvas the Maya landscape, connected by causeways that extend for kilometers. But it is not only that these ancient cities were larger and more populated than we had thought. Those surveys also show human-induced transformations that are more subtle, agricultural terracing within and surrounding city centers, often provisioned with water by networks of artificial dams, canals, and reservoirs. Such large-scale water infrastructure is not limited to ancient capitals, but occurs in their near and distant peripheries as well, in some cases providing the anchors to connect rural populations to city centers. These emerging landscapes of the Maya expose the fact that we have vastly underestimated the complexity of what we've long been calling complex societies. At the ancient Maya city of El Pamar, Thomas Garrison, Stephen Houston, and Omar Alcover Firbi identified an elaborate system that redirects natural drainages around a local lagoon. A nearly half kilometer long canal, excavated into bedrock and sometimes cutting through earlier abandoned causeways, channels water into anthropogenic wetlands. The fields are marked by small raised hummocks for crops, perhaps a kind of artificial chinampa system, similar to the one designed by the Mexica for the island capital of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan. In other areas of the Maya lowlands, Marcello Canudo and colleagues have similarly found large and small drainage channels that intersected at regular intervals, forming gridded, well-watered fields. Laser surveys also reveal that the ancient Maya manipulated natural topography to impede movement. The Maya area is covered in what Canudo and colleagues call built defensive systems, constructed bridges, ditches, ramparts, stone walls, and terraces, depending on local geography and often combined with natural defenses. The ancient capital of Tikal features 139 defensive features alone, including over 12 kilometers of per perimeter defenses. Not far to the east of Tikal, Garrison and Houston will soon begin excavations at La Cuernavilla, a site that appears to be an ancient fortress, complete with moats, ramps, and watchtowers. Rather than a natural forest dotted with ancient cities, the Maya world was intensely interconnected and manipulated by humans for millennia. The scale and extent of these features are undoubtedly impressive, yet ancient Maya infrastructure also offers an opportunity to reconsider what has counted and may still count as a monument, and in turn, how the notion of monumentality affects the ways that we, archaeologists and historians, understand the past. This evidence resonates with calls by Mediterranean survey archaeologists to, in the words of Susan Alcock, quote, mind the gaps that is, to attend to the lacunae between the cities and to ask what we're missing in places that seem, at first, empty. 
These landscape transformations are not examples of plazas, which are clearly defined and intentionally integrated negative spaces, which North American archaeologists like Tim Pocatot and Kenneth Sassaman have long called attention to. They're also not incipient monumental constructions that simply happened without planning, as Rosemary Joyce has argued for Mesoamerica's early communities. There are instances in which the Maya altered what a lagoon, what an escarpment, or what an island actually was. I direct a project at the Maya site of Toposte, which lies on a group of small islands in a lake in northern Guatemala, and is obviously not a bad place to work. Uh, the settlement on the Toposte Islands dates to the mid to late 13th century. That is, it is called post-classic in Maya, Mayanist terms. And although Mayanists no longer describe this epoch as decadent or degenerate as they once did, notions of decline and dissolution are implicit in the use of the post prefix. While classic and post-classic are technical classifications, most modern visitors would probably agree that the ruins on Toposte are less impressive than the massive pyramids, plazas, and ball courts of nearby cities like Tikal or Yasha. After visiting those grand sites, the colonnaded halls and residential structures that cover Toposte seem like a faint echo of classic Maya architecture, a miniaturized memory of former grandeur. What we are just beginning to realize, however, is that the Toposte Islands themselves and their underlying landscapes are a massive and long-lasting construction project. Archaeological survey and mapping have revealed raised artificial platforms, stepped bedrock terraces, long docks, and restricted plazas that are the products of its post-classic inhabitants. The surface area of the island is enlarged by multi-lobed cisterns excavated out of the bedrock and forming extensive underground chambers for burial and storage. And Toposhe is not unique among post-classic Maya cities in this respect. At Sakpeten, a nearby lacustrine city investigated by Don and Prudence Rice and Tim Pugh, a massive anthropogenic defensive system includes a large wall, two parapets or terraces separated by a moat or canal, and various fortification walls. The defenses at Sakpeten, situated at the northern peninsular end of the site, create a defensible, elevated, and isolate island refuse, much like Cornavia uh, centuries earlier. Focusing on art and architecture emphasizes the discontinuities between classic and post-classic Maya cities. But architecture was only a particular kind of Maya monumentality, one that is more salient in the present than it was in the past. If we look beyond the iconic and singular forms of temples and palaces, at the ground rather than the figures, it becomes possible to recognize continuity in place of rupture. Rather than seeing Toposte's squat pyramids and short stela as inferior echoes of classic period greatness, a literal ground-up view suggests that post-classic monumentality is a dynamic tradition of distinctly Maya ways of occupying the world. In a poem entitled To His Coy Mistress, the 17th century poet Andrew Marvel wrote, quote, my vegetable love should grow vaster than empires and more slow. That second line, vaster than empires and more slow, later became the name of a short science fiction story by Ursula K. Le Guin, in which explorers discover a world covered in thinking, feeling forests that react to and emotionally engage with humans. Archaeologists have long studied paleobotanical landscapes, but like Le Guin's explorers, rarely concern themselves with the interactions between living plants and humans. Throughout the Americas, however, vegetal matter can serve as a testament to the extent, longevity, and sophistication of indigenous manipulations of what could be loosely described as the natural environment. My second set of case studies involves the monumental anthropogenic forests of North, Central, and South America before and immediately after the arrival of Europeans. Spanish and British explorers to what is now the United States and Latin America almost invariably emphasize an abundance of plant and animal life from Florida to New England. They also often remark on the unusual character of North American forests. Rather than a dense tangle of trees and impenetrable underbrush, the woods of southern New England are strikingly open, almost park-like. When Giovanni de Verrazzano reached the Narragansett Bay in 1524, he noted the extensive open areas and forests that could be traversed easily, even by a large army. Likewise, Hernando de Soto's 16th century expedition, which consisted of 700 men in addition to herds of horses and swine, passed from pre present-day Florida to North Carolina and west to Arkansas without difficulty. A century later, 
William Wood wrote of Massachusetts Bay, quote, whereas it is generally conceived that the woods grow so thick that there is no more clear ground than is hewed out by labor of man, it is nothing so. In many places, diverse acres being clear so that one may ride a hunting in most places of the land. The timber of the country grows straight and tall, some trees being 20, some 30 foot high before they spread forth their branches. Environmental historians have combed through descriptions by travelers and settlers to show that those spacious forest understories were made and maintained by Native Americans. For example, Thomas Morton, a 17th century lawyer and author of New English Canaan, noted that, quote, the savages are accustomed to set fire of the country in all places where they come and to burn it twice a year, at the spring and at the fall of the leaf. These semi-annual fires moved quickly, burned with relatively low temperatures, and soon extinguished themselves. Regular burning removed underwood and fallen logs, leaving behind only large, widely spaced trees, a, a few shrubs, and grasses. Fires also enriched the soil, created conditions favorable to berries and other gatherable foods, and destroyed plant diseases and pests. Selective burning also promoted what ecologists call the edge effect, the creation of extensive regions resembling the boundary areas between forests and grasslands. These were ideal habitats for a host of wildlife, not only attracting game, but stimulating their population growth as well. The abundance of species that English colonists took as signs of wilderness, elk, deer, beaver, hare, porcupine, turkey, quail, etc., were instead the direct result of indigenous management strategies. As historian William Cronin has observed, quote, people accustomed to keeping domesticated animals lacked the conceptual tools to realize that Indians were practicing a more distant kind of husbandry than their own. To echo Cronin, people accustomed to thinking that monuments are that which can be built and inscribed in stone lacked the conceptual tools to realize that Indian landscapes constituted a resilient and vast form of monumentality. Further south, Similar environmental interventions seem to have been carried out by the ancient Maya. Ethnohistoric sources, for example, report that when Spanish conquistadors entered the jungles of northern Guatemala in the mid-16th century, they passed through an area of fire-cleared treeless savannas and flat plains filled with, filled with tamed and managed deer herds. One carved Maya vase likely shows the creation of that edge effect, similar to the uh, example from North America. The Maya hunting god, Huxip, is depicted carrying a torch, setting fire to a personified tree while beckoning deer from the forest. The scene is undoubtedly mythic, but raises key questions. First, monumentality is not only about size and scale, but about the acknowledgement and reading of particular constructions as monuments. This vessel consciously commemorates the transformation of the forest. Second, who is understood as propagating the fire and achieving the attendant effect in this scene? The personified trees raise the possibility that modified landscapes were recognized as more than just anthropogenic monuments. Paleoecologist Tim Beach and his colleagues have recently reviewed Maya impacts on climate, vegetation, and hydrology as the Maya scene, a microcosm of the early Anthropocene. In addition to the transformation of the savannas, they point to the movement of economic species beyond their usual distribution range. A Caribbean pine stand in the swampy bajos northeast of the major archaeological site of Tikal, and the presence of cacao trees in the moist microenvironments of sinkholes in northern Yucatan are relics of ancient Maya management. Biologist David Campbell and colleagues have even gone so far as to, as to refer to the entire contemporary Maya forest as one huge feral forest garden, the origins of which date back to at least 4,000 years ago. Key evidence from Amazonia further undermines what geographer William Denovan has criticized as the pristine myth of the pre-Columbian Americas. In a remarkable example of international collaboration involving over 100 co-authors, Carolina Levies and colleagues found that both the abundance and richness of domesticated plant species in Amazonia correlates with proximity to archaeological sites. In some cases, certain domesticated species were five times more common than would be expected by chance. In others, assemblages of up to 19 species with different geographical distributions and distinct ecological niches were found in the forests adjacent to sites of human occupation. Moreover, some cultivated species provide only long-term gains. Brazil nut stands, for example, take years to offer harvestable seeds but remain productive for centuries. Pequi trees bear fruit only after five to seven years but will produce for the next 50 to 70. 
Gardens and orchards, including particular species that will encourage the growth of others, are planted by plot owners for their descendants. And similarly, anthropologist Gustavo Politis describes how the Nukak of the Colombian Amazon seek out campsites around particular plants, which they believe were seeded by their ancestors. When they leave a temporary camp, the, the Nukak discard a large quantity of seeds, forming new patches for the future. Amazonian forests were not untouched by man. Quite the contrary, they were enriched beyond the scale of a single human lifetime with useful and edible domesticated species. Like medieval cathedrals or Greek and Roman temples that would take hundreds of years to construct, these are multi-generational projects undertaken at scales that seem almost unfathomable today. This is monumentality, but of an unusual sort, a changing construction formed by impermanent matter that continues to grow beyond the lifetimes of its makers. Attending to these ancient interventions offers new and distinctive ways of thinking about the past. For example, Amazonia has long been recognized as an independent center of domestication, but the lack of agricultural intensification in the deep past has been understood as a kind of stalling out, a permanent incomplete Neolithic revolution. Drawing on the evidence for widespread and long-term cultivation, however, anthropologist Carlos Fausto and archeologist Eduardo Goes Neves have recently called attention to the fact that there is no convincing reason why Amazonian cultural history should replicate that of old world cradles of agriculture. In Amazonia, they write, quote, manioc is raised rather than cultivated or planted, as are children and pets. Rather than imposing the concept of domestication, an implied rupture between nature and culture, they argue that the relations between plants and people should be understood through the widespread indigenous framework of familiarization, a process by which people make kin out of others. That is, the alterations of American forests by Amerindian peoples not only reveals often overlooked forms of ancient monumentality, but recognizing those changes as monuments broadens the kinds of questions and the kinds of interpretations that we can generate about the past. My final example takes us to the other side of the world, to the desert city of Petra in Jordan, where I direct excavations for Brown University's Petra Terrace's archeological project led by Felipe Rojas. Although Petra is famous for its rock cut facades and its role as a strategic caravan city along trade routes for spices and aromatics, our project's interests lie in the unpretentious interventions that gave shape to Petra's hinterlands and allowed for agriculture to feed the city. Elaborate dams and cisterns served both water storage and flood control purposes. Numerous channels and pipelines routed water from local springs to the city center, and backup wells provided a t protection against drought. The steep mountains, wide wadis, and narrow canyons that surround Petra were thoroughly transformed to facilitate water management and cultivation. Like curated forests and modified islands, the complex anthropogenic assemblages around Petra challenged traditional archaeological methods. They seem to be everywhere, extending as fractal iterations over the entire landscape, and every when, cross-cutting standard temporalities as many Nabataean or Roman features were maintained well into later periods. Some are still in use today. They also defy straightforward classification and analysis. It's futile to try to distinguish strictly agricultural from hydrological functions, or again, purely functional from religious or symbolic. Simple rock-cut shrines, sometimes including obelisks or the aniconic sculptures known as betels, are found often alongside water sources and agricultural installations. In a small wadi just to the north of Petra, Rojas documented a shrine that includes a triple betel associated with a 10-meter-long rock-cut channel that runs in front of it. Ashlar belonging to a ruined structure is strewn a few meters in front of the triple betel. This religious complex is in very close proximity to a large dam with a side sluice that must have served to control the flow of water down the wadi, as well as a cistern and agricultural processing facilities, a wine press and threshing floor. If we separate the betel as a religious structure from the dam, channels, and cistern as water management or infrastructure, and the presses as agricultural installations, perhaps no single feature would constitute a traditional monument, but the overall effect is undoubtedly monumental. The scale and complexity of this interconnected network are perhaps most readily apparent when individual components break down. The ancient city was well watered by aqueducts, pipes, pools, and even pressurized fountains, an organized system of flow and storage that not only supplied Petra with ample water, but also protected it from the force of seasonal flash floods. 
The modern archaeological site, however, suffers catastrophic flooding as violent torrents sometimes rush into the city center by the haphazard deterioration of the larger systems, dams, and channels, including in 1963 when 22 French tourists were killed in the Sikh, the, the main entrance into uh, Petra, and as recently as last winter. The disproportionate impact that a single element can have on the entire system, one broken cog that disables the machine, raises questions about who made and maintained such assemblages in the past. The size and construction techniques of many terraces suggest state-level organization, but their sheer number and distribution so far beyond the city center point instead to individual land tenants. For example, our recent excavations have shown that terraces well beyond the city center are massive constructions with dressed, coursed masonry. We've also documented a nearly four meter thick, wadi-wide dam, an enormous investment of labor, planning, and skill. At least in some cases, however, those cut ashlar blocks were erected atop simple earthen berms. And although we are still waiting for results that will help us date the construction of those terraces, it seems that some of Petra's spectacular water management system depended on and were literally built upon earlier efforts of small-scale agriculturalists. In this way, Petra's terraces are a bit like the philosophical paradox of the ship of Theseus, which poses the problem of whether the ship remains the same even as each of its boards is replaced with a new one. The overall form endures across millennia, despite the constant shifting of individual elements and material components. Moreover, the agricultural terraces, rock-cut channels, cisterns, dams, graves, altars, and shrines, taken as the aggregate assemblages of which they are a part, constitute a monument much larger and more complex than all of the city's monumental tombs combined. Each new installation requires a recognition of and engagement with earlier interventions, otherwise the system fails. The challenge they pose to archaeology is both spatial, how do we delineate the boundaries of an open-ended, interconnected system, and temporal, where in that dynamic landscape of maintenance and modification does antiquity end? What explains this epistemological blind spot, this inability to see the forest for the temples, as it were? The three sets of examples that I have detailed today, the, reship, the reshaping of the earth in ways simultaneously so large scale and subtle as to have been overlooked for centuries, the patient transformations of forests over many generations, and the production of functioning fractal machines over an entire regional landscape, are not only massive anthropogenic monuments, but irreducible to the sum total of their material components. As such, they present a distinct challenge for archaeology, a discipline designed to document singular forms that can be measured, described, and reproduced with drawings, photographs, and models. Art historian Wu Hung famously critiqued the notion of the monument by pointing out that the idea of a large, permanent public object is a construct of our own cultural history. But what counts as such an object from the past is likewise determined by the methods that we've devised for assessing monuments. A comparative ethnographic example, the work of Suzanne Kuchler on the Malagan of Papua New Guinea, serves to illustrate this point. The Malagan are assemblages of wood or woven vines decorated with carvings of animals, birds, shells, and human figures. These perishable items are used to mark human graves until such time as the soul is understood to have escaped from the body. The Malangan are then taken to a new location, often by the sea, and left there to rot. Once the decomposition is complete, the remains are gathered and used to fertilize gardens, transforming, in Kukcher's words, quote, the finality of death into a process of eternal return. The Malangan are unarguably monuments, but they actually become invisible archaeologically. By contrast, the systems that I've described should probably more accurately be termed unseen monumentality. As archaeologists increasingly come to acknowledge that people in the past not only intentionally altered their environments at monumental scales, but recognized and read those transformations as emblems of their ancestors and of themselves, there must be a way to reconcile such practices in the past with the practices of our discipline in the present. Recent material and methodological explanations are of the purview of archaeology expansions of the purview of archaeology have enabled those previously overlooked forms of monumentality to emerge, forcing a redefinition of the monumental. From artificial moats in the Maya lowlands to the diversity of Amazonian forests, 
Human life has never been isolated from the ecosystems that surround it, nor have humans simply placed monuments upon or within those environments. The next and more difficult task is to reimagine how we delineate, study, and share these extensive anthropogenic artifacts. Thank you. Okay, wow. Okay. Thank you very much for two great papers. Um, so it seems to be becoming a tradition, so if you would like to talk amongst <laughs> yourselves because before um, others chime in. Um, well, I'm really interested in this idea of this kind of emerging landscape. And um, I can certainly see connections in terms of you know, the role of the archive as a, an amazing repository of landscapes that perhaps have been overlooked or that have irrevocably changed because of climate change, et cetera. So I, I'd love to know more about, I mean, how that works both literally but also as a kind of a metaphor um, for making sense of the specific kind of monumentality you're working with. Well, I think, I mean, I think one of the, the things that was interesting about watching your presentation is to think about sort of these questions of how you can capture the monumentality of the landscape on Everest and the ways that, uh, that in some ways film sort of does a better job than photography in certain settings of scenes can sort of express that. And I think that that's, um, I mean, I think that, you know, archeologists have sort of been working on these questions of, uh, of how to read interventions in the landscapes that are at these, these scales that are sort of beyond what our, our discipline normally trains us to do. And of course, things like you know, satellite imagery and remote sensing are sort of expanding the possibilities for, for how we can think about landscape and how we can visualize, visualize landscape. Um, but I think sort of the key question now is sort of how, how do you communicate that both to one another, to you know, other people in your discipline, and more broadly, and I think some of the, the, uh, well, these questions about sort of the archives of, of landscape. I mean, how how do we create also in the moment the the archives of what it is that we're studying? Um, you know, I mean, as you saw in the PowerPoint, I mean, I have sort of these, um, the usual archaeological documentations of terraces or uh, the elevation profiles of the islands, and there's something sort of there's some, something that, uh, I mean, that seems to be the challenge, is the, the, how do you create an archive of landscape, or how do you create sort of a, a representation of these monuments that are not just bigger than a page, but bigger than, sure. you know, a computer can handle, and things like that. Absolutely. Yeah. It, um, is augmented reality of any use in terms of reconstructing? Space and as you say, the kind of green space in between buildings that tends to be neglected. Yeah, I mean, I think there's um, there's definitely people who have who have sort of uh, used this, and certainly at the um, at the site of Copan, and, and some of the imagery that's um, sort of coming out of lidar has been connected to sort of um, augmented realities. But I think. I think that's a possibility. I don't know that it's been done sort of well yet, but right. yeah, I think it is a possibility. It's just a question of sort of some of the experiential kind of phenomenological uh, aspects of it that you were talking about as well, that, you know, that's a hard one to, uh, never works as you hope, I think, with augmented reality. <laughs> right. I'm wondering, I'm, I'm wondering about this, I, I, during both of the, the talks and when I was reading your papers, I kept thinking of this, the term the natural monument, you know, that it finds different valence in different administrations in different languages, but there's always this idea that the Everest is a monument, right? There's this idea of nature in its more, most platonic sense, which is never, as you say, it's never quite nature with a capital N, mm -hmm. but there's this impetus to use nature to define monumentality and also to use monuments to define and protect nature. So I wonder if, is nature a necessary component? Because I, it seems that both your, your papers touch upon things that alter, mediate, manage, um, conquer, you know, different actions onto nature. Is this a, is this a 
part and parcel of monumentality? Has, does there have to be this term uh, or in your research or more generally? Well, I think, I think one thing that I would say that's sort of strange about that sort of formulation is that that idea that, that say, a monument is kind of an intervention into nature, I mean, the implication of that is that humans, that we ourselves are somehow unnatural. Right. And so uh, I think part of what's interesting, especially about some of the, um, I mean, these case studies where there's some ethnographic detail, so especially sort of the Amazonian case studies, um, what is sort of implied is a different way of conceiving nature, which is not separate from human interventions. And, that, and I think that's something that c kind of comes up with the Maya vessel that I showed, that it seems that there, there may be ideas about sort of humans and nature build the monuments together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what's kind of interesting is that, I mean, Everett is a monument without ever wanting to become a monument. I mean, I mean, it's an externally human-imposed designation. And I mean, certainly in the expedition films that I'm looking at, I mean, nature is something to be kind of managed. It is an impediment. I mean, so that there are all these kind of metaphors which construct it as... Um, you know, to be overcome. And I think that that in some ways then kind of shapes our understanding of the end goal. I mean, and often these expeditions are not entirely, I mean, they have a very clear sense of what it is they're going for, but along the way there are lots of dis distractions. I mean, nature intercedes and is this kind of fascinating interface, I think, in terms of, um, you know, how it ends up kind of shaping our some sort of sensorial engagement with the monument, but also how it then contributes to monument building. I mean, it's these images of Everest that clearly are marked in our minds as being, well, this is, this is what it is. This is the mountain, this is the peak, and this is how we should kind of make sense of it. Yeah. Let's open it up to the audience and Mary. Thank you both for such incredibly stimulating and thought-provoking talks, both of which feel as though they've almost opened a window on our scholar year theme for next year, which is art and ecology. Uh, but here's the, 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 the question that I thought I would like to hear from both of you about, which is if you could address how your projects and the actors in these projects um, address the question that we might call science, but I'm going to reframe science as the quest for precise knowledge, which almost all humans seek. Uh, they want to be able to keep track of uh, how water moves. And so there is um, where snow falls and how the drifts form. They want the, um, they are seeking precise knowledge. But the framework, when we step away from this and call it science, tends to move, I think it tends to move to, at first, it was seen to be the heroic individual. And now, actually, in the 21st century, one of the great heroic things about science often is that it's held to be the team. Um, I love the fact that we looked at a, a list of maybe 40 names, 60 names, uh, some of the work that comes out of the uh, CERN uh, project in, in Switzerland will have a thousand names, all as co-authors. Again, a kind of invisible monumentality. With that as a kind of jumping off point, um, would you talk a little bit about how the quest for precise knowledge is actually one of the things that is underpinning both the actors in your projects and uh, the outcomes of your projects? Well, precise knowledge is, is, a, is a, a sort of a tricky concept in some respects um, in relation to the Everest expeditions because these were not primarily collecting expeditions. But having said that, they certainly were measuring, they were looking at the natural habitat, but it certainly wasn't their end goal. Um, what I've been most interested in is how film exists as kind of empirical evidence. And of course, expeditions produce lots of different artifacts of knowledge, right? And cinema sits in there somewhere. 
and in some respects it's this empirical record, so it's scientific. And yet I think the expedition team had a very ambivalent relation to cinema. Um, there's evidence in the archive that it was this bloody cinema that's in our, in our way. I think they, they felt very, um, yes, ambivalent, I think, about their climbing being recorded and the idea of this emblem of modernity being there, um, sort of perhaps polluting this kind of pristine experience they were having. Um, but, but cinema kind of also has to um, fill in the kind of gaps in our imagination, um, but it coexists with measurements, it coexists with letters, diaries, field notes, all the other kinds of scientific matter, material stuff that comes out of expeditions. Um, I mean, I could, I could speak, I think, in more detail about this in relation to some of the other very scientific expeditions that were... Um, you know, explicitly concerned with, with collecting material culture or with animal specimens. But it, it, it's, it's, I think, kind of an absent presence in some respects, in my case. Uh, so I think I would say that, it, I mean, of course, it depends on sort of what science is. But in both, um, I mean, in all of the case studies that I talked about, um, all of those sort of manipulations and, and interventions are clearly the product of uh, sort of, I guess, repeated empirical observation of the results of interventions and modifications. So, you know, in Petra, if you build a terrace that routes water the wrong way, the next season there's, you know, some catastrophic flood and your neighbors are probably very upset. Um, in in the, uh, the Amazonian case, um, I mean, the species of, of trees that are being grown, uh, in some cases, you know, people are planting specific varieties of trees that they know will actually allow the next generation of tree to grow more effectively. So there's clearly sort of a um, something that comes out of repeated observation um, and kind of what I guess you would call kind of scientific testing, this kind of trial and error, which is sort of um, at the basis of science, I would say. Um, so that's the, the actors in the past. And then I think in the present setting that, I mean, I said sort of in the paper that, you know, one of the things that has been surprising is that it seems that we've sort of long underestimated the complexity of the people that we've been calling complex societies. And part of that is is in the nature of sort of the, the scientific inquiry that we sort of think that we're doing. And so, um, you know, when someone says my ancestors made the forest this way, Western science doesn't really have the kind of trial and error uh, method to investigate that. Um, although we've sort of force fitted into things like counting diversity and counting species richness and things like that. Um, and so I think that the, I mean, I think, uh, I guess there's a way in which sort of modern Western science often makes the monumentality of ancient science, another kind of invisible monumentality that you sort of can't see the, what's being uh, done in the past because of the way that you can ask questions in the present. Uh, we have a question from Dieter. And then... Yeah, thank you both for your talks. Uh, I have a question for Alison, and the good news is this time I will be brief. Uh, <laughs> um, when, while you were talking, I couldn't help thinking of a parallel case, which is the German mountain film. Yes. Uh, and I've been working on that a little, uh, and it's the same period, so mid-20s onwards. Right. And there are three distinct features that obviously are different from your case. Namely, first, it's f movies, fiction. Right. Uh, second, you always have a woman, uh, a particularly, I mean, a kind of... A, new image of a woman mm. who is mm. both athletic, seductive, mysterious, so kind of a unique type. Uh, and third, the two main proponents of this mountain film, uh, namely Louis Tranker and Leni Riefenstahl, uh, became fascists, <laughs> uh, um, famously. And so I was wondering whether there's a history of a movie, I mean, uh, of a mountain movie, in, uh, in this sense, mm -hmm. 
in, uh, in the English-speaking world, I have no idea uh, about that, and how they pick up these motives or compete with the German, let's say, role models or not right. so much right. uh, role models. Right. No, thank you. I, I do actually have a short section on the Berg film in a longer version of this paper um, that I'm sort of still working on. And I'm also interested in looking at mountain films that precede the Everest films. Um, but I, I, I do think that sort of, even though we, the only woman we see in this film um, are, are Tibetan peoples. We don't see any, any expedition wives. Um, but of course, the female is, is sort of constantly present in this film through the um, gendered construction of Everest. Um, and the kind of sexual metaphors that I just briefly alluded to are, are really quite intense in the intertitles, in the diaries, in the published accounts. Um, I mean, there are quite unsubtle sort of rape metaphors, um, which of course, you know, speak to a kind of a deeper colonial history of, um, you know, sexual oppression of women and men as well. Um, so I, I think that it, it's certainly possible to kind of trace um, some of these impulses that mountains seem to kind of evoke in the popular imaginary, right? I mean, certainly, you know, kind of fascist themes um, um, could be kind of mobilized in this film as well. Um, and there are sequences here too, which, which could quite easily be slotted into the Berg film. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I see it as a, as a kind of frame of reference um, and something to kind of think through, perhaps in a little bit more sort of nuanced way. And I'm hoping that some of the conversations here will just help me think a little bit more about um, the relation of this very specific national, national cinema. I mean, I certainly don't see any corresponding um, mountain film genre in other, certainly in North American film or in, or in British film at the time. We have a question in the middle and then Marie, yeah. Here, here, yeah. And then Marisa and then. Hi, good morning. Uh, first of all, oh, uh, thank you both. <laughs> two fascinating papers. I could not imagine something like this when I read the titles and the general title of the section. And so mine is more an observation, but maybe you can comment on my comments. Um, I'm going I'm back to the uh, uh, Nicholas. Uh, um, uh, well, he was mentioning this idea of the natural monumentality. Uh, which is basically what I immediately wrote it down when after, I mean, following your presentation. And one of the, what I think I take from this uh, symposium so far is that um, I, th I thought this was, a for me, a learning experience on see how many, if I can build a kind of taxonomy of what is monumentality, I mean, how many monuments, monumentality, and so on. So here I had the idea, technological sublime. I think, I mean, that the sublime, more than to, to the technological, has been very often in literature, painting, and so on, related to nature. So the natural sublime, we have something we can connect. But here, what I, I notice, or you see, there is something that goes beyond the natural. This, I'm fascinated by the idea of the unseen. And sometimes it's the unseen, it's the nature that allows the unseen, which is something, I mean, of a shift in my mind. Yesterday, we, had about, we heard about invisible. I think that invisible, it's another line in my taxonomy. The unseen is different from the invisible. But the, the next step in your presentation is the fact that there is a kind of what I would call a technological apparatus, your fractures, the, the cinema, the camera, the changing of lens that allows this unseen not only to become visible, but to become visible through, I mean, some of a technology. So we have a, a double, I mean, we have the natural landscape that become, that it's unseen, but then there is this technology that allows this unseen to become some part of our 
monumental approach. So this whole uh, scenario, I found it very interesting and it's my learning experience. Thank, thank you to all the organizers, that's all. Thank you. Do you want to chime in? Well, I would just say, I think, I mean, I think that uh, sort of relates to Mary's question about the role of science in the present, that it, there's something, I mean, at least in the, the case studies that I've used, that there is something ironic about sort of needing these technological advancements in order to understand the way that people experienced landscape in the past or sort of made their mark on landscapes in the past. And so it seems like there's something, there's some disjuncture between the way that we're understanding scale or the way that we're understanding um, these systems between sort of what the, the modern either assumptions are or actually the sort of capacity to think about the system and the, the ancient um, yeah, ideas about them. I'll just jump in and say thank you for that really great comment. I mean, I, I think when I talked about the sort of um, tension between, you know, cinema both being really stretched to the limit and challenged and yet opening up, and, you know, this, this incredible optic and sort of sensorial experiential sense of what it might have been like to have been on Everest. Um, you know, I specifically chose those kind of slow cinema sequences because I think in many ways they're incredibly evocative of um, an experiential encounter with the mountain and space. So I think you know, in some ways, not to construct a kind of hierarchy of sort of truth values around, you know, where, where is the experience of trying to climb Mount, uh, climb Mount Everest and which kind of, which, which media, which forms, which, which kinds of artistic practices or, or um, um, sort of confessional modes allow some access to the, to the mountain. And I think, you know, cinema in some ways, um, you know, it certainly triggers our imagination, but I think in terms of a sort of a phenomenological or, or an experiential mo mo modality, I think that it, it somehow does capture that, that kind of almost meditative sort of spiritual sense of just waiting. I mean, there's so much waiting going on and slow movement and, and it's, it's pure poetic metaphor, but I think in some ways it does get to um, both a sense of scale and um, obviously the sort of sublime vastness um, and something about, um, yeah, I mean, you know, the sort of cinema's erratic effect. We have a question here in the middle. You wanted to ask a question? Yeah. And then, oh, sorry. Uh, then we come to Marisa, I, because it was the first. I, I, I'm trying to keep fair. Uh, you will. Right. Then we get to Marisa and then to Wei Hong. I had a question for Sarah. Um, so, monuments, you know, we usually think of as communicative in some way, and what you're talking about is closer to infrastructure or something like that. And, um, you know, it's maybe those kind of structures you're talking about were meant to be read or interpreted in some way. That might be an interesting side question. But um, I'm interested in the fact that there are still these symbolic elements in those, you know, there's, in, at Petra, there's these betels, if I'm saying that right. Um, at a Maya site, it might be stele and pyramids, you know, the things that we expect <laughs> monuments to be. Um, now, you know, in the way you're presenting it, it seemed to be part of a much vaster system. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious how that sort of expanded field of monumentality um, changes your view of those symbolic, more obviously symbolic elements as well, and how those might be reinterpreted? Well, I think that, um, I mean, at, at Petra, the, uh, that particular example with the, the Betel is, uh, I mean, sort of what's monumental about it is kind of the, the whole assemblage that you have, uh, you know, this manipulation of water around this sort of rural shrine um, and there's a place for, uh, often at, at Petra these shrines have, um, there's sort of carved rock um, features around them that uh, can create waterfalls or, or sort of like little carved steps to um, create kind of specific movement to water. And um, even in the tombs in Petra, which you know are often sort of the, the kind of stereotypical idea of a monument, um, the, we have, 
one particular inscription that tells you that, that the, the idea of the tomb is not just the rock cut monument itself, but involves the cistern and the gardens and basically like the, the water around the tomb as well. And so I think that the, uh, I mean, in a way, some of the, the traditional kind of monuments that we've focused on, you know, they become kind of isolated from the setting. Um, and that's sort of what I meant with the beginning part about sort of the figure in the ground, that, um, you know, we're looking at the temple or we're looking at the tomb, or even we're looking at the plaza. I mean, it doesn't have to be actually like the, um, you know, like stone, like cut stone structures. Um, but really the, the monument involves sort of the manipulation of water around it or the trees. And I mean, we saw a little bit of that with uh, Wei Hung's theaters, you know, that they also involve the, the forest around the theater space or the, the shape of the, the bell around the complex. Um, and so I think in a way it sort of expands the, the idea of the monument. Uh, Marisa? so much. Um, I was thinking in both your talks about Francesco Petrarch's essay on the ascent of Mont Vento when he has this monumental aspiration to get to the top of a mountain. He thinks it's going to be this great accomplishment. Then he gets up there and he realizes this was kind of a futile enterprise and that nature is much bigger than him and he goes back down. Um, because I think what both your talks showed is that monumentality is profoundly relative um, that monumentality, in some sense, begins in both of your cases with a kind of large human ambition to accomplish something over space and time, and then ends with humanity being used as the small thing that relativizes the vastness of nature. So I'm wondering if either of you would go so far to say that the whole human concept of monumentality as an ambitious drive somehow depends actually on the inevitably grandest, like greater vastness of nature always in relation to anything human entity can achieve. Um, if that's implicit in both of your examples, because that's certainly a concept in a, in a spiritual context um, that happens uh, across different cultures. Hmm. Interesting question. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, there, there, there were huge stakes in terms of national pride for the Brits when they returned. Um, and through the various kind of archival materials that I've consulted, I mean, there is there is a kind of discourse of humility that certainly begins to surface. Um, but this was also an early case of, of the Brits trying to kind of do damage control or at least to reconstruct from a PR point of view, what it was they had accomplished. And so, I mean, one of the, some of the reasons that the film failed were because they simply, well, they didn't have success, but they also could not kind of shore up, um, you know, the kind of indexical power of the film through having the explorers physically be on stage at every screening to kind of validate you know, well, well, here's what we can recuperate from this. We do have some records. This was an astonishing, you know, we, we did our dandest best to get there and that stiff British upper lip came into, into, into play. Um, and of course, what the Brits wanted to do was let's get back out there, attempt number four. But I think sort of pulling back and widening to think about what this means with regards to sort of natural monuments, um, I do think that that even even had they got to the to the, to the top, I mean, their 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 own mountain demons and and their own very very raw experience of having been in World War One. I. I mean, there's an amazing book which kind of frames, you know, in their their fearlessness with their very visceral encounter with the massacre of World War One. I. I mean, they they literally didn't fear death because they'd seen so much of it. And so I think they're, they're all having kind of different sort of metaphysical, existential kind of experiences. But I think to kind of parse out, you know, what kind of experience of, of um, disappointment. I mean, here I am and it, maybe it's not as great. Um, you know, narratives of ascent versus narratives of descent, right? I mean, coming down the mountain is a very different experience than going up. Um, so no, I think it's a really rich um, trove of sort of textual <laughs> sources for sort of thinking about that kind of sort of slightly philosophical question, I guess, yeah. I think, um, I think I would say that, that 
it sort of gets back to this question of like, you know, what do we mean when we say the natural environment or when we say nature? Because if, if, if we're asking sort of whether monuments and monumentality depend on sort of the, the human scale relative to sort of the vast scale of nature, you do have to have an idea of the vast scale of nature. And if, you know, as, as in some places in the past and, and of course today also in other places, I mean, if a mountain is a person and not just sort of a part of an entire vast landscape of mountains, you know, it, it, does nature have a vast scale or is a mountain sort of uh, a reach, not, not the same scale as a human, but sort of a, a reachable interactive scale, you know, and same thing like a forest or an island. I mean, you know, um, yeah, I think the question is sort of, do we see those things as being part of this sort of vast and kind of variable uh, realm that is just sort of nature that is not the, the human realm? Or are those things sort of other persons in kind of different spheres um, at different scales, I guess? So we have uh, Wei Hong and then Nancy. Uh, so thank you two so much for a fascinating panel. And I thought it was really interesting that both of you raised the question of the object uh, in terms of monumentality. And for uh, Sarah's case, I think it's interesting for us to rethink really um, object not in terms of a Cartesian notion of object as inert, dead, with definable boundaries, but really object as vital, right? Something that keeps on growing and changing and shifting. Uh, and in relation to that, measuring it, it becomes a particularly interesting issue. And I think uh, the archaeological effort is also in relation to contemporary science in terms of um, laser serving, but also data science, right? How much more data we can gather to see new patterns. Uh, so there's almost a kind of a opposite movement. One is to, uh, to show uh, increasingly bigger scale to mask the totality of that scale to review a new notion of uh, that environment uh, at the same time to see almost a Sisyphus effort as Marissa was pointing out, the um, impossibility of that measurement. Um, and so for uh, Alison, I thought it was really interesting to think about object in a different term in relation to cinema technology uh, in terms of how the mountain itself is not a singular object. Uh, and there's no uh, master shot, right? Even, even through the extreme long shot, you cannot measure it. And so time plays such an important role in terms of it. I think time also plays a hugely important role in, uh, in Sarah's project in terms of the slowness and really long-term patterning. But here for cinema is thinking about time-lapse photography, think about the sequencing uh, and the movement. So it's, it's not really approaching the the mountain or nature from a particular vantage point of view, but right. really mobile engagement, moving in and out of it. And so I guess the last question I want to raise is really thinking about people, right? So the native as part of the nature, and also the, the mountain climbers uh, themselves inquiring their own nature, right? The celestial transcendence versus the darkness of um, of that destructive forces that's embedded in both um, these people and the people that they encounter as well as nature. So it's interesting let's, that Let's camera... try to allow okay. some space for answers because we're cutting it close. Thank you. Um, do you want to jump in first? Since, oh, yeah, I don't no, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. Um, obviously lots of really rich ideas there. Um, you know, what, one of the sort of concepts that I'm trying to work with in terms of the expedition film is this idea of it having a very anxious optic. Um, it's, it's never quite entirely sure what it is it should be looking at. It knows it's there for a reason. It's not entirely clear what that reason is often. There are expedition films that get made and nobody ever sees them. So there's never, an, there's never a clear inbuilt audience with some of the other case studies that I'm looking at. This film had a very clear sense of who its audience was. But you're right. I mean, Everest is this, is this um, elusive object. Um, it's often very difficult to know where you are. Um, if I were to show the entire film, there is a kind of a travelogue structure, um, but the mountain sequences them, themselves, as the film goes on, um, image gives way to text. It's intertidal after intertidal. We are literally um, resorting to this kind of, you know, um, narrator style travelogue um, mode of address. And, and that's incredibly frustrating. And a lot of the critics criticize the film for just relying way too much 
on intertitles. Um, in terms of the kind of encounters that you refer to, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a counter-monumentality built into this entire project, right? Uh, I mean, Everest means very different things for the Brits and for the Tibetan peoples. And that kind of tension, that, that tension in terms of the goals, um, its place in their sort of cultural, sort of philosophical imaginaries, um, I think, I think can be sort of tensed, uh, sort of not tensed, can be sensed in some of the images. And I try to kind of put some of those in there, those moments of reverse gaze, which seem to kind of, for me, betray this, why am I here, what am I doing? And, and Sherry Ortner has done a wonderful kind of ethnographic recuperation of, of how Tibetan people feel about the kind of, you know, sort of Faustian contract, double-edged sword of this industry that, that obviously supports their, their, their lives. But they're, you know, they're, they're terrified of this, of this labor. Um, so that's very complicated. Um, so yeah, those are just some thoughts. I wanna ensure we have time for more questions too. I would just say, I mean, I think that the, the uh, question that you mentioned at the end about sort of uh, temporality and time, I was thinking yesterday during your paper, you know, you had sort of this list of uh, characteristics of, of kind of monumentality. And I was sort of thinking, well, what do you do with things that are that have durability but no solidity, or sort of uh, you know long-term temporality but no stability, or something like that? That that there are these uh, objects that are sort of undeniably objects. I mean, you, you sort of can't say you know that the terracing system at, at Petra is not a thing, but it's also never the same. It's not the same thing, and it's not a thing that you can attribute to a particular point in time. And 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 I think that I mean one of the things that both thinking about the paper and just sort of sitting through the, the presentations is, you know, I think monumentality is such a sort of abstract notion that I'm not really sure that I know what it means <laughs> when we're using it, you know? Um, and I think, you know, we sort of have a clear idea that certain things are monumental or that certain things are monuments, but the monumentality is sort of a little bit more vague. Okay, one last quick question from Nancy. <laughs> spiritual film, and I can't remember what it's called, but it involves two, a British diplomat and his brother landing in Shangri-La. Do you know this movie? No. Circa 1940, black and white film. Lost Horizons. Yes, that, yeah, of you. course. It's based on the, the Hinton book. It's Lost Horizons. So to me, so people like me watch a film like that because this is what Hollywood does with the Tibetan monastery, lamasery. Right. And I'm wondering if anybody ever looked at these Everest films to see what a monastery really looked like. Right. But the bigger question is it, where the, if anybody knows where Lost Horizons was filmed and if Hollywood built a stage set, I'm wondering if they used mm -hmm. this Everage footage. I you've, got, don't... you've got to see the film because you'll yes, see. Yes, I know. You'll <laughs> see, anybody who's seen it knows why I'm asking these questions, right. I think. Yeah. Right. Now that, that must see the film. Yes. Um, no, to, to, I mean, the films did terribly in the United States. I think they got sort of two bookings. The United States audiences were, were not interested in this expedition. They had no kind of skin in, skin in the game, really. Um, but I, I think in terms of recuperating or at least being sort of opening up these films to, I think, um, different kinds of optics. I mean, one thing that I do t intend to do is to take this film back to Tibetan peoples. I mean, not literally have to go there, but certainly when I'm back in New York to kind of have some screenings, to, to try and kind of think about um, just what's the impact of watching this film today um, and, and to bring in that counter narrative because I think, or not counter narrative, that sort of absent narrative, because I think it's really important. Um, and this is obviously work that's being, doing, being done in documentary cinema to really you know, take these films back to kind of, um, uh, re, you know, to repatriate them to their communities in a non-condescending way to just have a conversation about the film. So that will be the kind of missing piece of this because I know there's lots of lofty gestures I have about the importance of kind of thinking about these films as, as Tibetan memory pieces, um, but I need, I need to kind of walk the walk as well as talk the talk on this and I, I certainly do intend to do it. I think these films really are there are lots of explorer accounts of Tibet. I've never, I've never come across these. Right. 
So thank you to our speakers and to everybody for this lively conversation.